Okay, so continue with this. So the idea, okay, you've got these different modes. There's the, the theta mode, the, the sharp wave ripple mode, as it's referred to. Sharp wave, you don't see the, when, when, uh, this is a the sharp wave ripple, was a terminology that was coined by Yuri Busaki. This is a figure from his 1989 paper where he points out these two modes. And here, this sort of the classical view, this was referred to as large or regular activity. Uh, and it, uh, you know, aptly, you look at it, you say, oh, look, you see these large reflections. They don't seem to have any kind of periodic structure, large or regular activity. If you zoom in on this, you can't see it here. What Yuri uh, um, described were these high frequency oscillations, the so-called ripples that rode on top of these uh, large deflections. And so he termed these structures as sharp wave ripple events. And that's sort of the more contemporary terminology that's used. Um, but <clears throat> going back to this, again, the theta rhythm, theta phase precession. So again, O'Keefe, 1990, discovers, along with Mike Retchy, discovers this relationship between distance in the field and spike phase. Uh, and uh, just in this, in, you know, in, in this figure, uh, while you're seeing this phase procession, I'm also illustrating something here that I'll, I'll come back to, and that is, this is recording simultaneously in two structures. In red is the hippocampus, and in black is the prefrontal cortex. In particular, the limbic, infralimbic, prelimbic, prefrontal cortex, evolutionarily old, conserved, and you know, enjoys you know, pretty intimate direct connectivity from hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex. And what you see here is that in the local field potential, you don't see the same kind of modulation, rhythmic modulation. You don't see the theta rhythm. But if you look at the timing of spikes in the prefrontal cortex, you notice something pretty striking. And that is prefrontal neurons are phase locked to the hippocampal theta rhythm. And we'll see this come up later. Uh, this idea of the rhythm itself serving not just to modulate local activity, this kind of phase procession like, you know, modulation or coding, but also serving potentially to coordinate communication across structures. So back to the phase procession. So this is, this is real data. This is, you know, over, you know, over 10 minutes, you just take a place cell, plot out spiking as a function of position on the track. You see the place field, but then if you add in phase, you find that it has this kind of structure. Now, as O'Keefe described it, and he sort of described this as this sort of this linear advance of phase as a function of distance. But when you look at it here, you kind of see, well, it's sort of, there, you know, but it actually has this little kind of nonlinear. And I always like to point out, if you actually take this diagram, the phase procession diagram, and you split it in half in two ways. One is I'm going to split it here in, I'll split it in distance, the first half of the field versus the second half of the field. So I just look at this half, you see this, you know, relationship does look pretty linear. You see a pretty good progression, right? The correlation between phase and distance is pretty good. If you look at the second half, if I just, if I, if I cut that out and I only showed you this part of it, you would say, I don't know, man, I don't see a whole lot. I mean, it's pretty steep. It looks pretty much like there's just a lot of spiking at this location. And so uh, you can think of this, this, uh, a relationship between phase and position or space and time as suggesting a kind of temporal code that you can read from the phase, the, abs the relative position. Here, on the other hand, in this, the lat latter half of the field, you don't really have that kind of, you don't have that kind of temporal code. If I tell you, you know, what the phase of the spike is, oh, it was at 360 degrees, it was at zero degrees. I can't tell, right? Well, they're all pretty much in the same spot. Uh, and so the only thing you can tell from this, is you can say, well, if I'm getting a lot of spikes, the rate is high, I'm probably in this, in this region. So there's kind of a rate coding. Firing rate number of spikes does vary as a function of relative position early or late. But the precise positioning within the field, this temporal coding is only present in the first half. I can do the same thing now if I split it in phase. If I look in the early, this late phase, if I just look at this part of it, that looks pretty good. That looks pretty linear, pretty good. If I look at the early phase, I get rid of this, and I said, I don't see any phase coding here, right? There's no, it's just, there's just a lot of spikes at this point, and the phase is pretty variable. So there's kind of this relationship between the linear correlation and the and phase variability that differs by first half, second half, early phase, late phase. Uh, and this was a model that Mayak Meta came up with when he first noted that there were these two changes that he, that he observed. One was 
that if you look at place fields over time, there's this sort of rapid change in field shape that they become asymmetric, spatially asymmetric, skewed opposite the direction of motion after a couple of laps. And that there's this sort of development of phase precession. The phase precession kind of emerges on a similar time scale. And so he kind of came up with this very simple model, tried to explain both of these things. And in, in this model, there are two elements to it. There is an excitatory input that comes into, let's say, a hippocampal place cell, shown in blue, and that this excitatory input has this kind of gradient structure that we were talking about. You can think about this as, this is a, you know, it's getting enteroidal input that correlates with like distal visual information as you get closer, you know, the drive gets larger. So you think about there are like lots of gradients. This is just a gradient structure. Uh, one thing I'll point out here, this sort of brought up after Mayak made this model and, you know, published it. And there was some pushback said, well, but this is, this cartoon is, doesn't seem right because you have, you're showing the excitatory input. It's being smooth, not just linear and gradient structure, but also smooth. Isn't it, doesn't it have this theta rhythmic modulation? Indeed it does. The input, if this is coming from the enterorhinal cortex, the input from the enterorhinal cortex is also theta modulated. And so to do this, to accurately represent this, what you'd really want to, this would be the envelope of a theta modulated input, right? And so what I would do is I would have to, you know, if I put in, Theta modulation on top of this, that would be more accurate. Um, now we'll see, okay, in order for the, the property that I'm going to describe to work, there's going to have to be a certain phase relationship between this theta modulated excitatory input and this red trace. So what's this red trace? The red trace is time varying inhibition. So indeed, when you look at the modulation of firing rate, in the hippocampus between the two primary populations of cells, the principal excitatory pyramidal cells, and then the inhibitory cells, largely interneurons, there are lots of different types of them, uh, but you say, I take the gabergic population, the primary gabergic population being these perisomatic parvalumin positive largely uh, uh, cells that fire at high rate, and they're very strongly theta modulated. So their activity, in fact, if you, if you, let's say you didn't have the field potential, and I want to know, oh, what's the, you know, is there theta or there's, is there not theta? Just record from the inhibitory neurons, and the firing rate is going to track theta pretty closely. And so you have time-varying inhibition, and then you have this gradient uh, excitation, which, if you, you know, we're going to add on top of it, yes, for physiological accuracy is also theta modulated. And now you just impose a very simple biophysical model that says a spike is going to be generated in this neuron when excitation exceeds inhibition, when blue is higher than red. That's it. That's a simple model. It doesn't require intact animal. You could do this in a dish. It's just, okay. When excitation exceeds inhibition, you get a spike. And then here, the question is, where does that happen? Now, when excitation is low, you have to wait until inhibition drops all the way down to here to get a spike. So weak input late phase activation. As input, as excitation grows stronger and stronger, you can fire, the spike occurs earlier and earlier. There's no, you know, there's no really deep insight here. It just says, yeah, stronger input, earlier firing. And just when you translate it here, when you combine inhibitory, you know, theta modulation with the spatial gradient structure, you get phase precession. Not only you get the advance, you also get some of these other properties. You say, okay, so you get spikes whenever blue is over red. Well, as you know, the, the excitation grows stronger, the you know, the time during which blue is over red, that increases. Phase variability. So this spike can occur here, but it can also occur anywhere in here. So you both get more spikes potentially. The timing of those spikes will become more variable. So this captures both phase variability. Firing rate correlate is a function of position and also the, you know, the phase precession. But then you can kind of come back, and I don't show it here, you can come back to this, like the critique, but yeah, yeah, but this is, this cartoon, it's not, it's not, it's not like a ramp, it's got theta in there. So yeah, you're right. You'd have to have, if I add theta, I'd have to do one thing. So think if I add this theta modulation, okay, and I make the theta, the excitatory theta, in phase with the inhibitory theta, right? What happens to this model? It, it doesn't work, right? 
doesn't work. It's like, oh, you're right. Yeah, it doesn't work. In order for this to work, I would have to take that and I have to have to shift it off me 90 degrees out of phase. I have to put it 90 degrees out of phase. I do that, right? So the envelope basically aligns to this. Oh, no, it's great, right? So that's exactly the phase relationship that you see. If you look at the phase relationship between theta modulation in the excitation, in the spiking output, and the corresponding inhibition is shifted by 90 degrees. It's out of phase. Now, there's some other interesting properties that we'll see about these phase relationships, which I'll get to later, uh, that suggests that, okay, so you're using phase to kind of perform this transformation. You're using phase to perform a transformation. This, these phase relationships form a transformation, for instance, here from this kind of gradient input to, you know, theta phase. And the way I describe this is that when you combine all of these things and you do it now, not just with one cell, but with two cells, now you see the property that you could say the hippocampus is really trying to get to emerge. And that is, so now I've got two place cells, one with a place field, blue here, purple just to the right of it, right? So now I've got like a behavioral time scale, takes some amount of time to get from here to here, spatial scale. And now I'm going to apply the same model and ask, when does the cell, when do the spikes from cell one fire relative to cell two? And what you see is, you know, with this kind of linear gradient structure, cell one is always going to fire before cell two, and it's going to fire at a fixed, there's going to be a fixed interval between them. It's going to be the, an interval that's defined by the time constant of the theta oscillation. So I've taken a behavioral time scale, variable behavioral time scale. How long does it take to get from here to here? I have no idea. Animal's excited, maybe, you know, Maybe it takes a second, he's not. Maybe it takes 10 seconds, a minute. This is variable, long and variable. It translates it into something that is fixed and short, right? So, and in fact, what it's doing is it's throwing away absolute time and just capturing temporal order. So it's taking the spatial order here and translating it into an ordered sequence. So I say this, when you combine all these things, spatially asymmetric, you know, excitatory input, time varying inhibition and this by bi simple biophysical you know excitation over inhibition you get a spike what you get is you get the transformation of variable behavioral time scale into fixed you know biophysical time scale and you get sequences within each theta cycle cell one cell two if i add in the thousands of cells that are going to be firing here each theta cycle is going to express a sequence that corresponds to some locations proximal where the animal is. And if we, if we, again, empirically, we just take all of those, we take this, the, the approach that I showed previously, instead of just showing the spikes, I'm not going to decode it. So use Bayesian decoding, but now on a short time scale, instead of 200 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, the gray here is, is the same as like the triangle, except now the intensity of the, you know, the darkness of the thing is the size, it's the probability. And now I'm going to decode it 20 milliseconds, what you see here now, and this is the animals now moving through space, moving along a path. We're decoding. What we see is that the code is not just where the animal is, but it kind of repeatedly sweeps from a position just behind the animal to a position just in front of the animal and does so every theta cycle. And if we just average all of these things together, and that is what is the average decoded position as a function of theta phase? We see this is the this is the hippocampal code. This is the theta sequence code. And that is, <clears throat> this is now the position of the animal right about right between the animal's eyes, and this is theta phase. And you kind of see it sweeps from behind the animal, just behind the animal, to a uh, position right in front of the animal. Does this every theta cycle? Yeah. So where do these, is it two different oscillators? Is it two different oscillators that exist? One for the excitation and one for the inhibition? Ah. Or is there like a filtering process that introduces a phase lag for the excitation? Or right, so, so like getting into the model. So I showed you, and you know, this is like a caveat emptor thing. This is a simple model. I, you know, I like this model, it's simple. It explains a lot of properties of phase precession. And the thing I really like about it is that if I take this, and I apply it to what I'll show you the, this, this quiet wakeful replay, reactivation, it also explains reactivation. Not only does it explain reactivation, but it can explain time forward and time reverse reactivation, all with exactly the same model. But that being said, and given that, as you point out, 
you know, I added in some, you know, you need to have like certain phase relationships in order to get this to work. It suggests that, you know, maybe having like multiple oscillators with, you know, different phase relationships is going to be important to understand this, you know, this phenomenon, for instance, theta sequence phase possession. And certainly the oscillatory interference model was another model that was actually proposed at the same time. And a part of that was, and so here, the oscillatory interference model, just in short, is so if I take two oscillators, two theta oscillators, I don't just shift them in phase, but I shift them in frequency, right? So one that's slightly faster than the other, the beat, right, the, the beat interference between them will also shift like this. You're going to get, right, as if I just look at the, even if they're in phase. Uh, so the idea was if you have an excitatory input <laughs> that's going just slightly, you know, at, you know, at a different frequency than this somatic, like inhibitory input, it was really more kind of a somatic dendritic uh, argument, but that these two theta oscillators at different frequencies will also give you the phase, phase precession. Um, now, is it one or the other? It could, be, it could be both. And as we'll see, in looking at theta, that theta and theta phase does in fact vary along the inputs, that different inputs come in at different phases and there are ways you can actually leverage that in useful way. So, uh, you know, thinking about biophysical models in which you combine, you know, uh, both frequency, phase, and, uh, and the path specificity of, the, uh, of those properties is going to give you certain computational um, uh, abilities. So here, this is just, this is the code. It's a theta sequence code. So hippocampus every, you know, 10 times a second, about 10 hertz, the hippocampal code is sweeping from just behind the animal to just in front of the animal. And so it's really, it's predicting, this is like from behind in front. You can also think of it as like past, future, that it's predicting in time. It could also be estimating in space. Um, and, you know, how would you potentially use that? Well, you might use that if you're actually, if you're trying to make decisions or planning, you're performing a spatial navigational task. And, um, these kind of spatial navigational tasks have been investigated with, uh, in their dependency to both the hippocampus and this other structure that I pointed to, the prefrontal cortex, in particular the limbic, infralimbic, prefrontal uh, uh, cortex. Lesions to either one of these in a simple task, for instance, like this, like a choice task, you're going to get behavioral deficits. Damage the hippocampus, you're going to have trouble with this task. Damage the prefrontal cortex, you'll have trouble with this task. Uh, and so asking, well, what are the hippocampus and pre, you need both of them, you know, how are they, you know, how are they interacting and how are they communicating and what might it have to do with this theta oscillation? So Matt Jones, when he's alive, did these recordings in the hippocampus, prefrontal cortex, looked at spiking, looked at local field potentials, um, and, um, and the variant of the task it's shown here. This is still a T-maze task, but now it's like a symmetric. It's a back-to-back T-maze task. And this back-to-back T-maze task is interesting because the animal starts at one location here, comes down, runs down the track, and then has to go to the, you know, choose the arm that corresponds to the side you started from. So you have to remember where you started from in order to decide where you're going to go to. The symmetric part is that instead of like after the animal goes over here, pick him up, put him back here, you let the animal turn around and run back. Now, when the animal runs back, and then when it gets over here, you, there's a little door that forces it one way or the other. So in this direction, the animal choosing, it's starting on one arm and it's going to another arm, right? But in this case, the animal's choosing. In this direction, animal starting in one arm, it's ending up another arm, but we're choosing. So choice, no choice. Similar behavior, running, turning, hippocampus is coding these locations, but there's no choice. And so... Uh, that's how you choice, first choice. And then, so Matt was able to take this, look at spiking, look at his relationships to theta uh, in both hippocampus and prefrontal cortex. And what he found was, it's sort of illustrated here, and that is that when you look at the phase locking of the prefrontal cortex to principal cells in the hippocampus, this is like the theta phase locking, prefrontal hippocampal, what you find is that there's enhanced phase locking in one condition, and that is when the animal is moving down the choice in the choice direction and it gets it correct. So it's correct choice. If it's running down in the choice direction and it gets it wrong, you find diminished coherence. 
If it's going in the other direction, where it doesn't make any choice at all, the force direction, coherence is down. So coherence in this case, if you look at, oh, our prefrontal cells tuned into or phase locked hippocampal theta, that predicts actual, that predicts correct choice behavior. Yeah. So during here means immediately before. Uh, immediately before the choice point? Ah, right. So if you, and, and I don't have a figure showing this, but if you, if you look at where does this actually occur, it's pretty interesting. And that is, what you find is the elevated coherence is right here. It's right as the animal comes, it's about in a half second. So, you know, like four or five theta cycles just before it makes it, as soon as it actually makes the choice, the coherence goes away. So it's like the selective transient and performance correlated, you know, coherence. It's like the prefrontal cortex is tuned into the hippocampus for about a half second just before making a choice. And you don't see that effect in the hippocampus itself. Hippocampal, you know, the phase locking to the theta rhythm is independent really of, of choice. For fixed, force, correct, incorrect, it doesn't matter. So the hippocampus is doing this like this theta sequence coding across the whole apparatus. It's just that that theta sequence coding only becomes behavioral performance relevant when it's locked to the prefrontal cortex. Like the prefrontal cortex is reading out something about the hippocampal theta code. Yeah. So in this case, it's a correlation between the hippocampal input, because it's you know a population readout of the postsynaptic potentials in the hippocampus, and prefrontal cortex, right? Sort of. The, so you're right. The theta that we're recording, you say, oh, the theta, that reflects, that's like the input. But when you look at the theta sequence, you say, oh, there's an output. The theta sequence is the output that is locked to the input. Right. And that's what the prefrontal cortex is going to be seeing. Now you can ask, so what is it that the prefrontal cortex is seeing of that, of that um, hippocampal output, right? Because I already told you, well, the hippocampal output, it's not like one thing, right? It, it differs by phase. That if the animal, so you can see the prefrontal cortex could be tuned into different phase channels. And if you actually take prefrontal cells, and you look at their preferred phase locking, it's like different prefrontal cells will prefer to fire at different phases, like they're tuned into different phases. So you can say prefrontal cells that are tuned into, in this case, like this early phase, early phase information, what they're going to see is they're going to see, oh, this is where the animal is. So you can get like present state information by tuning into, in this case, early phase the early phase output. You're looking at the first part of this, of this theta sequence. If you just shift your tuning, say, well, actually, I would like, I would prefer to listen, you know, tune into the where am I going to go next channel of the hippocampus. You simply shift your phase preference. And what you find in the prefrontal cortex, prefrontal cells are actually much more broadly distributed in terms of their phase pre preference. Most of the hippocampal cells, it's their phase pre preference is concentrated as you might expect it's just based on firing rate most of the spikes are locked to this phase prefrontal cells spread it out so you've got prefrontal cells simultaneously listening to the where am i now channel or where am i you know where where did i just come from where am i now where am i going to and so thinking about how you would how you would take advantage of that where now i have simultaneous coding and decoding with present future and past state that's what you're actually so I wouldn't be able to see this effect at the level of spike-spike correlations because neurons transition between Absolutely, you could. predictive and unpredictive? Oh, you could. Could. Yeah, and so okay. this – um, I think I have the spike-spike. So this is – yeah, this is just the um, – yeah, this is just the spike. This is just spike field. But you can also see it in these spike-spike correlations. If you correlate individual, you know, prefrontal cells, hippocampal cells – you see those. But, see but the then, same sort but of then if prefrontal cortical cells are listening to a specific predictive channel, and you know the animal's moving, so uh, spikes in the hippocampus are transitioning between you know being future predictive and being past predictive, depending on where. It's they a good question. Is. How you would read out the correlation? So you know you're actually just looking at the correlations. What you really want to see is like, is this prefrontal cell firing, you know, in response to this hippocampal cell? So it's harder to actually infer direct connectivity. Sure particularly okay. when you have these kind of phase lock relationships, right? They're both firing at the same time. That's because they're both locked to this, you know, a shared, you know, this common, you know, common input. 
Um, yeah, I think that um, the like the, the the perturbation stuff that I'll show you here, where, in which you can you can manipulate hippocampal activity and then look at prefrontal you know activity. That's that's the way in which you would actually test that. And so I'll get kind of get to that next. And that is so in this case again, predictive the coherence predicts performance. It doesn't in in the hippocampus prefrontal cortex. It doesn't in the hippocampus. The hippocampal code is not is not dependent upon, uh, or performance is not dependent upon these, you know, the hippocampal theta sequences. Um, and there's been, you know, some discussion about, oh, do the theta sequences, do they actually reflect like vicarious trial and error? Do they predict the animal's future behavior? And they certainly do correlate with future behavior once an animal has learned a task. You get the place cells now become trajectory dependent. If the animal's gonna go right, you see one set of place cells fire. If, if it's gonna go left, you get another set of place cells firing. That's because, again, like the directionality, directionality, if I look at a cell after the animal's gone through a location, I say, oh, look, the animal's at this location. I know that it's going to go you know, forward next instead of backward. Same thing happens. You have the bifurcating paths. And so it's really a reflection of past experience rather than a prediction of future experience. Of course, it, in a task like this, past experience predicts future experience because that's what you're doing. You're training them, right, to drive future behavior based on past behavior. Yeah. Why is that? Now, I don't know why that is. This is just saying it is suggesting that the coherence itself, you know, when you have coherence, that reflects, you know, the communication of information that drives correct performance. It's, but it's just that's just speculative. Again, based on the timing as well, that you see this coherence just before the animal, the 500 milliseconds, just before the animal actually makes the choice. And then as soon as it makes the choice, it, it, it goes away. Again, suggesting that but, but the path specificity doesn't go away So in the hippocampus. So it suggests that the coherence isn't establishing the fields. It's just using the relationship between the fields and the behavior to drive choice. But who's making the choice? I would say the prefrontal cortex is, you know, driving the choice, not the hippocampus. That's the, that's the idea. Um, and this just shows that you can also see this in the, if you just look and you don't have spikes, but you're just looking at the local field potentials, if you pick up theta, and you can't pick up theta in the prefrontal cortex depending on the positioning of the electrode, what you find is you get this transient coherence in the theta band as well. So the hippocampus is going to theta, the prefrontal cortex also has a theta signal, and then when they become coherent, that predicts choice, and that the, the predictive coherence is selective for the theta band. So this is like coherence across other frequencies, it's really in theta that correlates when, you know, when coherence is high, that correlates with correct choice. That's the. But now you can, you can ask this question. Okay, you see correlated, but is it really causal? What would you need to do in order to demonstrate causal relationship between this phase locking and performance? And that's where the use of optogenetic manipulation. So you say, well, let's go in and let's manipulate um, hippocampal output as a function of theta phase and see, you know, does it make any difference? And so this is an experiment that Josh Siegel did. And the idea here is that you're going to express channel rhodopsin and, you know, optically activatable, uh, you know, excitatory channel in inhibitory cells. So you can drive inhibition transiently and selectively in a closed loop fashion as a function of theta phase. So a brief activation of these channels drives inhibitory activity. When you drive activatory activity, you suppress excitatory activity. That's the, that's the idea. So the idea is shut down the hippocampus, you know, during theta, see what it does. Now, the thinking was, okay, what we're going to test is this idea that it's theta activity, theta coherence here just in this, right? That's the, you know, that's the critical communication. So the thinking is if I inhibit hippocampal theta output right at the, you know, just before the choice point, Animals can't perform the task. Classic kind of lesion study, right? You're looking for loss of function. Uh, you know, it's just in this case, it can be, you know, transient reversible. So that was the idea. Uh, interestingly, when Josh actually initially did this and just tried to like tonically inhibit the hippocampus, just to, like shut it down, you know, not, you know, not respecting the theta phase locking, he could indeed, you could sort of tamp down hippocampal activity, but when it bounced back, it would trigger this remapping. So it really would, it really kind of screwed up 
hippocampal activity. And sort of think about it, if you have a network that's trying to like homeostatically maintain some sort of level of output and you shut everything off, the state that it returns to is not necessarily the state it started from. And so that's basically what you find. So, you know, to make it more physiological, you realize, no, I actually have to make the, the, the inhibition more physiological. I have to lock it to theta. But if I'm going to lock it to theta, I have to choose a phase. And so what he, did, what he decided to do was, okay, I'm going to, I, I have to design the experiment. So I'm going to inhibit hippocampal output at different phases, theta phases. But also you want to know that, well, maybe if you just like inhibit, you know, opt-genic inhibition just screws up performance. How do you know that it's, you know, it's activity right at this part of the, you know, the task? So you have to do it with respect to task phase as well. So I have to optogenetically inhibit activity, for instance, here at the starting point and at the choice point, two behavioral phases, and I have to do different theta phases. So that's what we did. Simple two by two design, two theta phases, peak trough, 180 degrees out of phase, and then two behavioral task phases, starting arm, choice point. That's the idea. Uh, <clears throat> and and the thinking being, oh, what you're going to see is you're going to find that, oh, there's like, there's the optimal phase, right? There's a certain phase where hippocampus is talking to the prefrontal cortex. And you inhibit that phase, you're going to get some loss of function, right? They're not going to be able to perform. And that that's going to be selective for this part of the maze. That was the expectation. And he didn't get any of that. He got exactly, you know, the counterintuitive result was that inhibition, phase-dependent inhibition, um, actually improved performance. So when he, when he inhibited hippocampal output, in this case, let's say, at, in the stem, in the stem at one of the phases, in this case, at the trough, so there's like a peak in the trough stimulation, it actually improved it. So you think, what, what? how do you improve performance by inhibiting activity, let's say, in the trough? So you think, oh, maybe there's something about the trough. But then he also got the complementary result is that is he could also enhance performance by inhibiting at the peak. But now this delivered um, in this in the starting point or what he referred to as the encoding segment. So that these two phases peak inhibition enhanced performance when delivered here at the start point trough inhibition improved performance when delivered here at the stem. So it's, there wasn't, it's not a good phase and a bad phase. It's like one phase enhances it, but when delivered at one task phase, one theta phase and one task phase, and the other theta phase at another task phase. So it's like a double dissociation. It wasn't, oh, one is a good phase. It's like both phases are good. It's just that they have to be delivered at the right task phase. So what the heck does that, what does that mean? Why would you even get that? Well, to understand that, you really have to know something a little bit more about the circuit. So if we look at the circuit, this is all done in CA1. CA1 has two primary inputs. One, this classic trisynaptic input that I described to you, and as you know, stuff comes in from the superficial enteral cortex, dentate gyrus, dentate to CA3, CA3, some recurrence, and then to CA1. This is the classic trisynaptic loop in and out. But there's another direct input. It's referred as the temporal ammonic, temporal, that's the temporal lobe, the uh, enterinal input, ammonic, Ammon's horn, that's the CA region. So from direct from enterinal into CA3. So you got these two inputs, direct enterinal processed through dentate CA3 inputs. Now these inputs come in, they're, they're kind of laminar, anatomically orient, organized. The enterinal inputs come in a little bit further, further down, you know, the dendrite, CA3 inputs a little bit more proximal, but there's another property that's really important. And that is that those two inputs, they're theta modulated and they're out of phase, 180 degrees out of phase. So what you see is at any given time, at any phase, you're kind of shifting. The hippocampal output is dominated by enterinal and then CA3 input. So you're getting this, you know, depending on which phase of the theta oscillation you're looking at, it's being driven by this direct or the indirect. The, this associative network input, recurrent associative network input, or the direct enteronal input, going back and forth. And so you can think about what that inhibition was doing, phase-dependent inhibition. When you do this trough inhibition, right, you're suppressing hippocampal output that is dominated by enteronal input. So what you're really doing, it's like an input-specific manipulation. 
hippocampal output associated with enteral input, when you shut that down, what you find is, this is at this trough stimulation, when you do that here in the central stem, performance gets better. If you do the converse, I'm going to suppress, you know, here at the peak, suppress CA3 input, this recurrent autoassociative input, and I do that here in the encoding segment, performance gets better. So what you're doing by suppressing one phase is you're enhancing the influence of the other phase. So you can think of this as really, oh, trough stimulation, more CA3, right? Hippocampal output should be more CA3 dependent. Here, peak stimulations, CA1 output should be more enterinal dependent. And what's interesting about this is the shift means that when you look at the this, these two phases, so we have this like uh, the phase dependent, early phase, late phase. This early phase is also associated with enterinal input. You can think of this, oh, this is the enterinal phase. This is the CA3 phase. Enterinal phase associated with past, present state, CA3 input driving future state. Manipulating either present or future, biasing it, future state is more relevant when you're going to make a choice, present state is more relevant when you're actually trying to establish, you know, your starting location. And so you have these different phases driven by different inputs or different circuits that contribute different functions in different phases of the task. And again, bringing that back around to this, the discussion of the prefrontal cortex. So you can imagine now I've got these different prefrontal cells, right, that are tuning into the different channels. So in a sense, they're not just tuning into, oh, you know, present, future, or, you know, current position, you know, you know, position, you know, behind or ahead, ahead of the animal. They're actually kind of tuning into, I want the hippocampal, hippocampal output driven by, like, enterinal present state versus CA3, where CA3, you know, maybe performing some sort of predictive estimation based upon, like, some, like a model-based estimate as opposed to, like, a you know, immediate world state estimate. And, um, you know, where, um, you know, thinking about prefrontal activity tuning into different kinds of models, where I'm really, you know, I'm encoding my present state using different models. Where am I now? Where did I come from? Where, you know, where, you know, where am I going to be? Uh, you can think about another property of the hippocampus, which I didn't, you know, explain. And that is that even though I kind of showed you the one, the, like the classic cross section, the circuit, the hippocampus also has this longitudinal organization. Everything I described to you is done in the dorsal hippocampus. But there, you know, if you follow it down more ventrally, the hippocampus varies along this dorsal to ventral axis. In humans, it's more this anterior, anterior, posterior, where Anti where the kind of the posterior cortex hippocampus in humans is like the dorsal hippocampus in rodents. And that's where you see a lot of spatial processing. Um, if you look in the more ventral hippocampus, this is where you find more direct connections to the prefrontal cortex. There's a lot of emotional social processing that goes on there. And so you have the hippocampus performing similar kinds of functions for, you know, sort of different purposes using the same sort of circuit. But what you find there is there's a difference in the relative organization that, you know, the proportion of inputs, for instance, coming from the enterinal cortex versus, you know, CA3. And so, again, you have to think about, uh, you know, a, a system that is building models using timing phase, present, future state information, recurrent, direct, you know, feed forward inputs, uh, and then organizing this based on the intended output targets. And that's the that's the kind of the hippocampal, that's the hippocampal model. Now, kind of make a change of a sort of, uh, a sort of a change in gears, thinking about temporal coding. So I think what, you know, I've tried to demonstrate is that there is a temporal code that phase is actually used as a mechanism for establishing and coordinating and communicating that information, that the temporal code exists, you know, uh, 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 concurrently with this, with a, a rate code, and that both of these can be used in a task and task phase dependent way to direct behavior. Uh, so that there is this sequential or at least, you know, time sequence dependency in the code. But how is it actually, is this, you know, is this something that is actually maintained? And that is, uh, does the hippocampus hold on to this? 
How is it actually used to process information post-experience, not just during experience? And that were, that's where the work looking at the role of sleep comes in. So the thinking is experience makes changes. Those changes are retained and they're used to later, you know, uh, alter information coding, either to store it, to, you know, drive uh, the formation of models, to, uh, you know, modify or instruct, you know, other systems or circuits. But there's a process of learning and memory that goes on after immediate experience, and that might go on during sleep. And you can break down sleep and think about these two basic stages, REM and non-REM. Uh, REM sleep is what you uh, typically associate with dream sleep. It's often referred as paradoxical sleep. The, the local field potentials of the EEG looks very much like, and, and, uh, and uh, neural activity looks very much like the awake state, except that you're physically immobilized. Non-REM, the evolutionarily more primitive. You can find non-REM correlates, even going back to, it's argued in like invertebrates and Drosophila, for instance, have periods of you know, immobility that, that share a lot of the properties of uh, vertebrate non-REM sleep. Again, even looking at uh, immobility and non-REM sleep, activity in the hippocampus and also in other brain areas, for instance, in this so-called like, you know, the kind of resting state um, and uh, associated networks are very similar. So non-REM sleep is related in many ways to quiet immobility. You can think of it as the, there's sort of an evolution of that. When you're immobile, you're engaged in a kind of processing I refer to as offline processing, uh, as brain activity driven by internal state. If you extend that long enough, you can enter into this more persistent, uh, perhaps you know more uh, uh, peripherally disconnected state that we would call sleep, non-REM sleep. And then you can transition into this fictive waking state, which is evolutionarily more, more recent. It had been argued that is something that evolved you know, in mammalian systems exclusively, but there's a lot of interesting work looking at it in other vertebrate systems, in particular um, in, uh, in, uh, in reptiles, but also in birds to see that there are correlates, REM-like correlates. So REM is something you could say that evolved when sleep and the, the pressure to sleep extended beyond the functional, uh, let's say, constraints of non-REM, that there's certain processing that you can, you know, there's only so much you can do sitting doing nothing. And then many animals that don't have strong circadian drive to their sleep, you just wake up and you do some, so there's waking processing, online processing, offline processing. Extended offline periods, you introduce this sort of fictive waking state or REM state. Um, but I'm going to just kind of focus on this non-REM state. And non-REM sleep, this was Albert Lee when he was a guy interested in the lab, uh, did this very simple experiment, recording animal when it's running, sort of looking at the structure of play cell activity, and then recording activity during sleep, both uh, uh, non-REM, showed here in gray, and REM in, uh, in uh, red. Uh, and this is actual sleep structure. So one of the things about sleep that you find is that <clears throat> that there's the, the sort of a, a non-uniform distribution of REM and non-REM states that you find non-REM tends to be loaded uh, on the sleep onset side. So early in a, in a kind of a sleep cycle, you get more non-REM early on. REM tends to, you know, increase in frequency and duration the longer you sleep. So at the end of a sleep cycle, this would be like animal. We get the animal, you know, on its, it's you know, it's it's just waking up after, you know, period in its light cycle. It's just waking up and you see a lot of REM. In fact, the last thing that you probably experience that animals that are, that, you know, have REM, non-REM is probably REM. And that's because you find that there's this, that non-REM, there are these different depths of non-REM sleep. You go from kind of a, initially a, a light, a light sleep. They're scored as in terms of these numbers, non-REM, they have like non-REM stage one, Non-REM, say two, stage three, which is very deep sleep, indicated by the presence of these intense synchronized low frequency oscillations, uh, um, delta frequency oscillations. And then you transition into REM. And, and, and after REM, you transition either into, back into this initial, you know, like non-REM sleep, or you might wake up. So there's this transition here where the end of REM is like, you know, you're a little bit more arousable. And so it's very likely that the last REM, you know, at the end of REM, when you wake up in the morning, it's, you just came out of REM, which is why what you might experience when you wake up is like, oh man, that dream was great. You know, it was probably REM. And 
it might make you think that, oh, yeah, okay, that's what, you know, REM sleep is when you dream. But it turns out when you actually look at activity and you use this decoding approach to activity in both REM and non-REM, that you find decodable activity in both, both states. So this idea that REM sleep is dream sleep is not, is not exactly accurate. There's a difference in the structure and potentially the content of REM and non-REM, but I can maybe talk about that offline. But if we just focus on the activity here, non-REM sleep early after, on, after sleep onset, animals just run on a task, it just goes to sleep, get a lot of non-REM early on, let's just decode that activity. That's what Albert did. And so he starts off, he just records place cells. Here they're just lined up so you can see place cells, different cells fire at different locations, which means they'll fire in a sequence. And then Albert used an approach to look for using, you know, using sort of a, 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 an analytical approach combinatorial analysis to determine the likelihood of seeing sequences that have particular ordered structure, ask what's the likelihood that you would actually see cells if they're going to fire in a particular order? What's the likelihood that they'll fire in the order that the animal actually ran through them? And what he discovered is that there were periods where you found extremely unlikely sequences, higher order sequences, like seven or more, that got expressed periodically, and they were, they were locked to this sharp wave ripple event. So when you get sharp wave ripples, cells fire, and when they tend to fire in sharp wave ripples, they tend to fire in these extended sequences, kind of recapitulating long, you know, ordered sequences of place cell activity. Again, sequences, sharp wave ripples. Um, now, when Albert first published this, actually, even in this diagram, you can see something here, which he didn't point out, but we'll, you know, point out in just a second. And that is, so here's a sequence of place cells. Uh, and then here is some, here's a, here's a sharp wave ripple event, but it's not exactly, it's not one sharp wave ripple event. Sharp wave ripple is very discrete, about 80 to 100 milliseconds, you can see, and you get this ripple on here. So this is actually two sharp wave ripple events. So what you find is that you get these sharp wave ripple events, not just in isolation, but you can find them, bursts of these, a sequence of multiple sharp wave ripples. And so what Albert was illustrating here is something that we discovered subsequently, and that is <clears throat> that you can get longer sequences by chaining together multiple short sequences. The sharp wave ripple is really sort of a unit, a sequential unit, and then you can link them together to get longer sequences. And when you look at the time scale of this sharp wave ripple, I mentioned it's like 80 to 100 milliseconds. 80 to 100 milliseconds is exactly the time scale of the theta oscillation. So theta oscillation is about 10 hertz, sharp wave ripple about 100 milliseconds. And we'll see that that's not accidental, that when you look at these the sequences that you find in sharp wave ripples, they tend to correspond to the sequences that I described in theta. So the theta sequence is really, you can think of it as the sequential memory unit that gets re-expressed here during sharp wave ripples and can be chained together in these longer sequences. So you can think of this as like, hey, this is like a sleep theta, you know, multiple theta sequence. You know, imagine the animal moving through these locations at the, like, the peak rate, as fast as you could possibly go that's sort of what you're seeing here, the you know, time invariant theta sequence reactivation. Um, and I'm just going to briefly mention this, that the uh, a postdoc in the lab also you know, asked the question, OK, you see these reactivated events in the hippocampus. How are they expressed in other brain areas? Thinking about like the dream correlate is the visual imagery that's associated with it, recorded in the visual areas, visual uh, primary, secondary visual cortex and rodent. And this is a task in which they had an animal running on a figure eight uh, with uh, visual inserts with different textures. So depending on the location, the animals were seeing you know, different visual cues, recorded uh, individual cells in both the hippocampus and the visual cortex. And there are two things they noted that were interesting. One is that when an animal is running, you're recording the visual cortex and the animal is moving in space, visual cortical cells have place fields. They have spatial receptive fields, not just visual receptive fields. So there's a visual correlate. You can demonstrate this. You say, oh, yeah, but they just respond to the visual cues of that location. OK, yeah, but if you turn the lights off, you see the, the fields are still there. The firing rates go down dramatically, but the bias, the spatial bias, remains. So there's a predict, spatial predictive component to the visual response that is modulated by the immediate sensory cues, very much like the hippocampus, uh, where if you turn off the lights, there's some effect, but the place fields themselves persist. They're just less, the hippocampal cells are less dependent on any single modality because they're, you know, getting information from, you know, self-motion information, visual, auditory, all of these uh, 
And so, this, and the second thing is that you get place fields, place like fields in the visual cortex, which means you can identify these visual sequences. You found that, you know, in periods during which you get hippocampal reactivation, this is a hippocampal place field, this is a reactivated place field, you also find that you get like reactivate, sequence reactivation in the visual cortex, and it's aligned to the hippocampal reactivation. So when hippocampus reactivates a sequence, visual cortex reacts, reactivates a sequence corresponding to the visual, the sequence of visual cues that were present there. So it suggests that, again, re, the non-REM reactivation is not simply a hippocampal, you know, hippocampally restricted event. There's imagery associated with it. Does that mean it's a, it's like, it's a dream correlate? I don't know, but it, it does indicate that this kind of sequential reactivation and reevaluation is expressed in different uh, brain areas. And that all of this, that these replay events I focused on the hippocampal sharp and ripple events, but during sleep and non-REM sleep in particular, activity is modulated by this slower rhythm, both so-called slow oscillation, slow waves as they're seen in the, the EEG or local field potential, but at the cellular level, they tend to correlate with the slow oscillation or slow uh, uh, fluctuation between depolarization, hyperpolarization in individual cells that are coordinated across populations. So you have a bunch of cells that'll start firing, then they're silent, then they fire in the silent, so-called upstates and downstates. And those are locked to these, the slow oscillation, the slow wave signal in the EEG. And so what you have is you have these slow oscillations here in the visual cortex, but you see a similar kind of structure in the hippocampus. But there's a slight shift in the phase here, the that is that, the, that this, this up-like state, upstate here, and cells turning on the visual cortex tends to precede upstate of the turning on of activity in the hippocampus by about 50 to 80 milliseconds or so. So the idea is that you have this kind of up and down, you know, cells turning on, visual cortex turns on, it drives the hippocampus, hippocampus turns on. During these up-like states, that's when you get these sharp wave ripple events. You can see them here. This is filtered in the ripple band, so you can see these ripple events. When you do the decoding or reconstruction, this is where you find these extended sequences, and that is replay of sequences across multiple sharp wave ripples. And the time scale of slow oscillations, roughly, you know, half second to a second or so, can vary, you know, depending on species. But it's 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 on the scale of multiple sharp wave ripple events. So sharp wave ripple is like 100 milliseconds. These upstates are like, you know, five plus sharp wave ripple. So you think of this is like the unit. Now another level of unit processing of extended sequences of coordinated sequence processing between the hippocampus and visual cortex now on the time scale like a half a second. And <clears throat> you can kind of see here that, yeah, the beginning, the cortex starts it, hippocampus follows it, and then the end of the downstate also, you know, it stops in the cortex before it stops in the hippocampus. So hippo visual cortex initiates it, but then the hippocampus clearly has some ability to generate activity that persists beyond the immediate availability of visual cortical, in, of, of cortical input, and that this activity could then influence the next upstate. So you kind of think of this dialogue, cortex, hippocampus, cortex, hippocampus, back and forth, uh, as being sort of the nature of hippocampal cortical dialogue. Uh, yeah, we're basically, we're basically out of time, but uh, um, I just sort of point out here, you know, doing experiments, if, this, if it is the case that the, the cortex is driving hippocampal replay, you might imagine if I could, you know, if I could access or bias this cortical state, maybe it could drive hippocampal replay. And it turns out that there is one cortical sensory area that is amenable to that kind of intervention. That's the auditory cortex, the auditory system, because the auditory system during sleep maintains sort of heightened vigilance, or you could say the uh, the you know, the perceptual state you know, of, the visual, of the auditory cortex remains. And that is, animals are still they can still hear while they're you know, while they're asleep, they just don't wake up. And so arousal is low, but like vigilance remains high. And what that means is you can deliver auditory cues and they're going to influence uh, these auditory pathways. So you can actually bias this content in auditory cortex and then look at what happens in the visual cortex or in the, in the hippocampus. And Dan Bender, when he was in the lab, did this experiment, had a task in which auditory cues were used to kind of instruct spatial behavior. It's an auditory cued spatial uh, memory task. Poked his nose, you hear these two, either a down sweep or an up sweep. Uh, 
It's down sweep, tells you to go left, up sweep, tells you to go right, simple task. Then the animal goes to sleep, and then just every 10 seconds or so, you just play either the up sweep or the down sweep. You're just delivering this little cue every 10 seconds or so. And then asking them what happens, you know, what happens to, uh, so you're doing the task, the animal goes to sleep, you're getting like these sharp wave ripple events, here's like an example of sharp wave ripple events, and you're also playing sounds, you're playing a sound. So I play like a left sound, Look in the hippocampus, what's going on in the hippocampus? When you decode activity following, for instance, playing the left sound, what you tend to find is the hippocampus is biased to replay leftward trajectories. You do the right sound, you get rightward trajectories. That's the, that's the idea. So if you play leftward sounds, you tend to activate leftward place fields. Okay, rightward sounds, you tend to get uh, rightward place fields. Uh, uh, but another interesting property of this is that 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 bias was not, it was not immediately tied to the cue. So you deliver the cue and even up to like 10 seconds later, you continue to see this bias and activation. Again, suggesting the cortex kicks it off, but then there's this sort of back and forth, continued reverberation. In fact, if anything, the bias got stronger the later you actually went, suggesting there was, you know, some sort of positive like feedback and incremental, you know, uh, you know, increase in cued content presumably driven by the hippocampus because the cortex is no longer being actively driven. Um, and then this, so this suggests, oh, okay, you can influence memory processing during sleep, but I haven't really showed you that it's memory processing. Uh, there are some human experiments that were done that, dem that demonstrate this direct positive impact on performance. And uh, <clears throat> um, I think the one in particular, um, um, that I like here is, uh, came out of uh, Ken Paler's lab uh, at Northwestern University. And here what he did was, uh, you know, the classical kind of memory, sleep and memory experiments involve, oh, you disrupt sleep and animals and, you know, or people perform poorly. It's harder to demonstrate the positive input, input, impact. And that is, do people get better because of selective sleep, con you know, processing? And so Ken was able to leverage this auditory cueing to selectively enhance sleep processing. And that is you have this task where you have a visual auditory, you know, spatial memory task. You have to remember, oh, you see certain cues, cats shown here, you know, you flip over the card, and then you sort of flip over the cards, you remember the spatial layout of these different visual cues. But what Paler did was to now pair the visual cues with an auditory cue. You flip over the cat, you hear a cat sound. You flip over the teapot, you hear a teapot sound. And then during sleep, you would play either the cat or the teapot sound periodically, just the way we were doing it. With the rat, and what he found is when you do that, and now people wake up, and you ask them, "Okay, find the find the cat, find the teapot." They're better at finding the cues, visual cues that were associated with the auditory cues that were delivered during sleep. He was effectively able to bias, you know, performance through selective modulation of sleep content. Uh, now, uh, um, some similar experiments were done. Jan Born did some experiments using olfactory cueing. Those were sort of earlier, but they didn't have the selectivity. It's like this is really, this is not just sleep enhancement. This is cue-specific sleep enhancement. You didn't just get better at the task. You got better at the, the one thing that you were cueing during the task during sleep. Um, and I think I'll just, I'll just kind of end it there. I'm going to, I'll just mention, you know, one other experiment that I really like. You know, if I were to kind of go on and we would talk about, you know, kind of recordings in the BTA, looking at reward signaling, what you find is that reward signaling is also paired with replay. So not only do you have visual cortex saying, oh, yeah, this is what I saw, you have the VTA signaling, oh, yeah, this is what you got when you actually got to this location. So there's a spatial reward correlate. Um, and that that, that that spatial reward correlate is, is strongly expressed during quiet wakeful replay, but isn't seen during sleep. So you say, that's kind of curious. Why are you not doing reward processing during the sleep reactivation? Uh, well, Kareem Benchanain in Paris did this experiment where he, very much like Paler, tried to uh, kind of externally influence activity during replay. And so he did this closed loop experiment that tied hippocampal activation to VTA stimulation. So driving this is sort of classic work where uh, this is the sort of the work, the, you know, the pleasure, identifying so called pleasure pathways, stimulating the medial forebrain bundle that connects the VTA uh, to the accumbens, and you can 
you know, if you do this in, in behaving animals, you can drive this very powerful acquisition of preference. You can get any, you know, you got if you stimulate an animal, walks over to a certain location, you stimulate the, you know, the the dopamine pathways that in, in, in the VTA, animals will immediately acquire a very powerful preference for that location. If you show them a coke can and you stimulate, they'll like their coke can. You can just basically get them doing it. You get them to, you know, press a bar until they drop dead if you deliver the stimulus. So it's very powerful you know, primary reinforcer. Well, Ben Shanain did this, but now the condition stimulus in this case was not a location, was not a, you know, a Coke can, but rather was the activation of a place cell. And so the idea was you're taking this, the, 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 the expression of acquired place preference, where if an animal goes to a location, you stimulate it, they prefer that location. And so what he does here is expose an animal to an environment maps out the place field, there's no stimulation. So it's like, yeah, okay, I, you know, I got a map for this. But then takes the activity during sleep, and when the, whenever a particular place cell that would fire at a location is activated, he stimulates the MFB. So he's stimulating dopamine delivery contingent on place cell activity during sleep. And the remarkable thing is that now, you, after the animal wakes up, you put him back in that environment, and it's like, Wow, I really like this place. I don't know why. I really like this place. Never been associated, right? This is a completely de novo act, you know, acquisition. Never been, never actually paired that location with reward during wakefulness, only during sleep. And that was sufficient to drive a behavioral place preference. So what it demonstrates is the capacity to learn, you know, like reward value information during sleep is there. It's very powerfully and it's very powerfully expressed because this was like a really simple experiment. It wasn't even this, there's no higher order decoding, wasn't population, it's just a single place cell. Just tie that to a single place cell. That was sufficient to give you that. Uh, and given that, as you pointed out, single place cell doesn't just fire in that one environment, it fires in lots of environments. So it's very likely that that simple intervention probably drove preference for a whole host of things. Anything with that place cell, I was like, I like that. <laughs> I really like that. And, and so it's sort of, it, it makes you think about, okay, if sleep is where you do learning, right? And you think learning is driven by some sort of, you know, optimization, sort of, you know, goal-dependent optimization. Um, is that always a good thing? Is that the kind of learning that naturally goes on during sleep? And, you know, clearly it seems, it does seem to go on during quiet wakefulness where, you know, if you're learning a task, it's like, I want to learn how to get better at this task. But during sleep, you can think the nature of the optimization is slightly different. It's not optimizing single, you know, single tasks. There can be another function, whereas the objective is to try to generalize across tasks to identify common statistical structure to build models, which you can then use to optimally drive goal-directed behavior. So building models during sleep, optimizing the use of those models to acquire goals during wakefulness, all driven by this fundamental hippocampal code, which captures sequential structure, which can string it together, forms it during wakefulness, and this kind of theta, analog theta sequence, temporal phase coding new strategy, re-expresses it during sleep. Um, and um, I, I, I'll end it there. Just, you know, the closing would be kind of thinking about well, how does that like tie into contemporary machine learning, thinking about, you know, learning a search, uh, I'm, I'm sort of struck by a lot of the you know, similarities and you know, systems like you know, AlphaGo, which employ you know, clever you know, sort of deep search uh, you know, approaches using replay, re offline like simulation mechanisms. Um, there are other ways, I didn't actually show this, but this, the idea that there's this forward and reverse replay, thinking about what, is it, what does reverse replay mean. Uh, there's some really, you know, I think, very uh, tantalizing work that um, that a recent graduate student of mine was a physics student has been you know has been doing kind of thinking about replay not necessarily as planning but you know thinking about it as uh, it's more like kind of a manifold learning in which you're actually translating you're translating two point boundary value problems into initial value problems it's very much like sort of conventional reinforcement learning it's like you're trying to take information about a remote goal and you're trying to map it back into a starting point so that you can use you just do forward integration from the starting point right so to optimize the goal. Well, if you generalize that and say, look, maybe the hippocampus is just trying to figure out how do you map like remote future state onto present state, even if it's not associated with a goal. It could be just for general navigation, for instance. And how would you actually do that? And so he's kind of come up with an algorithm that involves, it's like this 
iterative, you know, forward and reverse. You're using this kind of iterative shooter-like method. Where you just kind of do series of forward and reverse, you know, evaluations to create two complementary functions, these a state co-state function, which that allow you to do rapid forward integration for, you know, a, a, for a large set, a space of, uh, you know, potential trajectories, not just a single one. And so it's like, how do you create representations that allow you to map future state into present state for the purpose of planning? I think that that's really kind of an interesting way of thinking about it, building representations on models that could be used for that purpose rather than reinforcing specific memories or specific trajectories, or specific goal, uh, you know, relationships for solving singular tasks. Okay, that's it. <laughs>